Lesson 3 The Law as Teacher Sabbath Afternoon October 10 In Christ's Sermon on the Mount, light and truth are given, and principles laid down which apply to every condition of life and to every duty that God requires at our hands. Christ had come to magnify and make honorable the law that he himself had proclaimed from Mount Sinai to his chosen people during their wilderness wandering. In all his lessons, Christ sought to impress upon the minds and hearts of his hearers the principles which underlie his great standard of righteousness. He taught them that if they would keep God's commandments, love for God and for their fellow men must be manifested in their daily life. He sought to instill into their hearts the love he felt for humanity. Thus he sowed the seeds of truth, the fruits of which will produce a rich harvest of holiness and beauty of character. The holy influence will not only be far-reaching while time shall last, but its results will be felt throughout eternity. It will sanctify the actions and have a purifying influence wherever it exists. Reflecting Christ, page 61. The law was not spoken at Sinai exclusively for the benefit of the Hebrews. God honored them by making them the guardians and keepers of his law, but it was to be held as a sacred trust for the whole world. The precepts of the Decalogue are adapted to all mankind, and they were given for the instruction and government of all. Ten precepts, brief, comprehensive, and authoritative, cover the duty of man to God and to his fellow man, and all based upon the great fundamental principle of love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke chapter 10 verse 27. See also Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5 and Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. In the Ten Commandments, these principles are carried out in detail and made applicable to the condition and circumstances of man. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 305 The Savior typified in the rites and ceremonies of the Jewish law is the very same that is revealed in the Gospel. The clouds that enveloped His divine form have rolled back, the mists and shades have disappeared, and Jesus, the world's Redeemer, stands revealed. He who proclaimed the law from Sinai and delivered to Moses the precepts of the ritual law is the same that spoke the Sermon on the Mount. The great principles of love to God, which he set forth as the foundation of the law and the prophets, are only a reiteration of what he had spoken through Moses to the Hebrew people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. The teacher is the same in both dispensations. God's claims are the same. The principles of his government are the same. For all proceed from him with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 17. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. Sunday, October 11. To love and to fear God. Greater attention should be given by religious teachers to instructing the people in the facts and lessons of Bible history and the warnings and requirements of the Lord. These should be presented in simple language adapted to the comprehension of children. It should be a part of the work both of ministers and parents to see that the young are instructed in the scriptures. Parents can and should interest their children in the varied knowledge found in the sacred pages. But if they would interest their sons and daughters in the Word of God, they must be interested in it themselves. Those who desire their children to love and reverence God must talk of His goodness, His majesty, and His power as revealed in His Word and in the works of creation. 
Every chapter and every verse of the Bible is a communication from God to men. We should bind its precepts as signs upon our hands and as frontlets between our eyes. If studied and obeyed, it would lead God's people, as the Israelites were led, by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 504 True reverence for God is inspired by a sense of His infinite greatness and a realization of His presence. With this sense of the unseen, every heart should be deeply impressed. The hour and place of prayer are sacred because God is there. And as reverence is manifested in attitude and demeanor, the feeling that inspires it will be deepened. Holy and reverend is His name, the psalmist declares. Psalm 111 verse 9 Angels, when they speak that name, veil their faces. With what reverence, then, should we, who are fallen and sinful, Take it upon our lips. Prophets and Kings, pages 48 and 49. God wants you to recognize the divine presence. His peace and comfort and grace and joy will change the shadow of death into bright morning and blessed sunshine. A reverential spirit realizes that the heart must be kept by the power of God. Ministering angels open the eyes of the mind and heart to see wonderful things in the divine law, in the natural world, and in the eternal things revealed by the Holy Spirit. My Life Today, page 291 With untold love, our God has loved us, and our love awakens toward Him as we comprehend something of the length and breadth and depth and height of this love that passeth knowledge. By the revelation of the attractive loveliness of Christ, by the knowledge of His love expressed to us while we were yet sinners, the stubborn heart is melted and subdued, and the sinner is transformed and becomes a child of heaven. God does not employ compulsory measures. Love is the agent which He uses to expel sin from the heart. By it, he changes pride into humility and enmity and unbelief into love and faith. The law is but a transcript of the character of God. Behold in your heavenly Father a perfect manifestation of the principles which are the foundation of his government. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 76 and 77. Monday, October 12. A WITNESS AGAINST YOU In the days of the wilderness wandering, the Lord had made abundant provision for His children to keep in remembrance the words of His law. After the settlement in Canaan, the divine precepts were to be repeated daily in every home. They were to be written plainly upon the doorposts and gates and spread upon memorial tables. They were to be set to music and chanted by young and old. Priests were to teach these holy precepts in public assemblies, and the rulers of the land were to make them their daily study. Meditate therein day and night, the Lord commanded Joshua concerning the book of the law, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 Prophets and Kings, pages 464 and 465. When the judgment shall sit, and everyone shall be judged by the things written in the books, the authority of God's law will be looked upon in a light altogether different from that in which it is now regarded by the Christian world. Satan has blinded their eyes and confused their understanding, as he blinded and confused Adam and Eve and led them into transgression. The law of Jehovah is great, even as its author is great. In the judgment, it will be recognized as holy, just, and good in all its requirements. Those who transgress this law will find that they have a serious account to settle with God, for His claims are decisive. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 986. 
God requires at this time just what He required of the holy pair in Eden, perfect obedience to His requirements. His law remains the same in all ages. The great standard of righteousness presented in the Old Testament is not lowered in the New. It is not the work of the gospel to weaken the claims of God's holy law, but to bring men up where they can keep its precepts. The faith in Christ which saves the soul is not what it is represented to be by many. Believe, believe is their cry. Only believe in Christ and you will be saved. It is all you have to do. While true faith trusts wholly in Christ for salvation, it will lead to perfect conformity to the law of God. Faith is manifested by works. And the Apostle John declares, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. It is impossible for us to exalt the law of Jehovah unless we take hold of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1073. Tuesday, October 13. That you may prosper. If men will walk in the path that God has marked out for them, they will have a counselor whose wisdom is far above any human wisdom. Joshua was a wise general because God was his guide. The first sword that Joshua used was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It was because the strongest influences were to be brought to bear against his principles of righteousness that the Lord in mercy charged him not to turn to the right hand or to the left. He was to follow a course of strictest integrity. If there had been no peril before Joshua, God would not over and over again have charged him to be of good courage. But amid all his cares, Joshua had his God to guide him. Joshua, the commander of Israel, searched the books diligently in which Moses had faithfully chronicled the directions given by God, his requirements, reproofs, and restrictions, lest he should move unadvisedly. Conflict and Courage, page 116. As the Bible presents two laws, one changeless and eternal, the other provisional and temporary, so there are two covenants. The covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden, when after the fall there was given a divine promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. To all men, this covenant offered pardon and the assisting grace of God for future obedience through faith in Christ. It also promised them eternal life on condition of fidelity to God's law. Thus the patriarchs received the hope of salvation. Though this covenant was made with Adam and renewed to Abraham, it could not be ratified until the death of Christ. It had existed by the promise of God since the first intimation of redemption had been given. It had been accepted by faith, yet when ratified by Christ, it is called a new covenant. The law of God was the basis of this covenant, which was simply an arrangement for bringing men again into harmony with the divine will, placing them where they could obey God's law. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 370. We must take our stand to acknowledge fully the power and authority of God's Word, whether or not it agrees with our preconceived opinions. We have a perfect guidebook. The Lord has spoken to us, and whatever may be the consequences, we are to receive His Word and practice it in daily life, else we shall be choosing our own version of duty and shall be doing exactly the opposite of that which our Heavenly Father has appointed us to do. We are not our own to act as we choose. We are called to be representatives of Christ. We are bought with a price. As the chosen sons and daughters of God, we should be obedient children acting in accordance with the principles of his character as revealed through his Son. Medical Ministry, pages 255 and 256. Wednesday, October 14. The Toils and Struggles of Lawkeepers. 
Hezekiah and his associates instituted various reforms for the upbuilding of the spiritual and temporal interests of the kingdom. Throughout all Judah, the king wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God, and in every work that he began, he did it with all his heart and prospered. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered. Verses 20 and 21, and 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 to 7. The reign of Hezekiah was characterized by a series of remarkable providences which revealed to the surrounding nations that the God of Israel was with his people. Since the days of David, there had reigned no king who had wrought so mightily for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God in a time of apostasy and discouragement as had Hezekiah. He had served his God faithfully and had strengthened the confidence of the people in Jehovah as their supreme ruler. Prophets and Kings, pages 338 to 341. Jesus did not interpose to deliver John the Baptist. He knew that John would bear the test. Gladly would the Savior have come to John to brighten the dungeon gloom with his own presence. But he was not to place himself in the hands of enemies and imperil his own mission. Gladly would he have delivered his faithful servant. But for the sake of thousands who in after years must pass from prison to death, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom. As the followers of Jesus should languish in lonely cells or perish by the sword, the rack, or the faggot, apparently forsaken by God and man, what a stay to their hearts would be the thought that John the Baptist, to whose faithfulness Christ himself had borne witness, had passed through a similar experience. Satan was permitted to cut short the earthly life of God's messenger, but that life, which is hid with Christ in God, the destroyer could not reach. Colossians chapter 3 verse 3. He exulted that he had brought sorrow upon Christ, but he had failed of conquering John. Death itself only placed him forever beyond the power of temptation. In this warfare, Satan was revealing his own character. Before the witnessing universe, he made manifest his enmity toward God and man. The Desire of Ages, page 224 Into the experience of all, there come times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earth-born children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences, we should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life, would spring into being. Prophets and Kings, page 162 Thursday, October 15 Jesus, our example. If any man will come after me, Christ said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is the proof of discipleship. If church members would be doers of the word, as they solemnly pledged themselves to be when they received baptism, they would love their brethren and would be constantly seeking for unity and harmony. Those who believe in Christ and walk humbly with Him, who watch to see what they can do to help and bless and strengthen the souls of others, cooperate with the angels who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Jesus gives them grace and wisdom and righteousness, making them a blessing to all with whom they are brought in contact. The more humble they are in their own estimation, the more blessings they receive from God, because receiving does not exalt them.
they make a right use of their blessings, for they receive to impart. This Day with God, page 356. Christ came to our world and lived in the home of a peasant. He wore the best garments his parents could provide, but they were the humble garments of the peasants. He walked the rough paths and climbed the steeps of the hillsides and mountains. When he walked the streets, he was apparently alone, for human eyes did not behold his heavenly attendants. He learned the trade of a carpenter that he might stamp all honest labor as honorable and ennobling to all who work with an eye single to the glory of God. Christ, the Lord of the whole earth, was a humble artisan. He was unrecognized, neglected, and despised. But he held his commission and authority from the highest power, the Sovereign of Heaven. Angels were his attendants, for Christ was doing his Father's business just as much when toiling at the bench as a carpenter as when working miracles for the multitude. His work must begin in consecrating the humble trade of the craftsmen who have toiled for their daily bread. Had Christ passed his life among the grand and the rich, the world of toilers would have been deprived of the inspiration which the Lord intended they should have. The Upward Look, page 67. Instead of thinking of your discouragements, think of the power you can claim in Christ's name. Let your imagination take hold upon things unseen. Let your thoughts be directed to the evidences of the great love of God for you. Faith can endure trial, resist temptation, bear up under disappointment. Jesus lives as our advocate. All is ours that his mediation secures. Think you not that Christ values those who live wholly for him? Think you not that he visits those who, like the beloved John in exile, are for his sake in hard and trying places? God will not suffer one of his true-hearted workers to be left alone, to struggle against great odds and be overcome. He preserves as a precious jewel everyone whose life is hid with Christ in him. Of every such one, he says, I will make thee as a signet. For I have chosen thee. Haggai chapter 2, verse 23. Ministry of Healing, page 488. For further reading, Lift Him Up, Compare Scripture with Scripture, page 114. And The Upward Look, Educate Yourself to Believe, page 376.